Hello, I'm Shirley Adams and I welcome you back to my studio and The Sewing Connection for Series 3. The idea behind all these programs is that you can have anything you want on your terms if you sew. Sewing is your connection to the world of fashion. The central theme behind this series is the flip side, the alternatives when one way fails or what happens when you turn your thinking around backwards, inside out. Have you ever bought a record or a tape for a particular piece and discovered that you like the flip side even better? This series is the same idea. It began, as most things do for me, in a fabric shop when I saw this very interesting piece of tapestry. Now I thought the colors, the tulip design fascinating and yet so bold. Would I actually wear something this overpowering? You must feel comfortable in your clothes. You wear them and they can't dominate you. I kept going back to this fabric as I realized that the colors did go with several other garments I own. Well, I finally turned it over, and there it was, the flip side. On the wrong side, with its softer nuances, I could see many more wearable possibilities. Anyway, who's to say what's right and what's wrong? When you sew, you're the designer, and you choose what you like. I think possibly I bought this fabric in the final analysis just because it was such a challenge and I couldn't resist it. I thought, now that's going to be something interesting to play with. What am I going to do with it? Uh, I, I in, was interested in possibly using both sides of this because look what happens. Here's the same flower going across here. All three of these are the same flower. But when I turn this one over, look at what the other side looks like. And I thought, oh, to use these two in combination with each other would be a really good idea. So what inspired me, I think, uh, beyond just looking at this, was this suit that a friend of mine was wearing. And I said, oh, may I borrow that? I would like to take a better look at that, examine it, and see what you've done with it. She did make this suit. It's a silk denim, which is an unusual fabric. But what this suit is, is using both sides of it. So she has put wrong sides together as she did the sewing. And then the seams come to the outside, and they are pressed back and stitched on top here. So it's a really interesting uh, type uh, uh, sewing that she's done here. She's really handled this problem in a nice way. So I want to show you how that works, because I wanted to try it out myself to see how it works. You can look at it and think, oh, is this the way it was done? And yes, you have to try it out to make sure that you know it's going right. So here I have, not with silk denim, with some cotton denim, the wrong sides together, so I'm going to make a seam here and then see what happens. Just get these pieces down here together and away we go. Okay, and when we get to the other end, let's press it open and then just uh, see what happens with uh, doing the same type operation. So I will not only press this open, and something that, this, uh, that is this stubborn, stubborn as denim is, uh, you better press open with your fingers maybe before you do it with the iron. And it would also be a good idea possibly to cut your fabric just a little bit bigger for this because uh, deeper seams might be easier than the 5 8 seam that I have here. A 3 quarter seam, for instance, would be a little easier. The reason for this being, after I have this pressed open, I then want to hem under each of these little seam allowances on each side. And because they are kind of small, this is going to be a little bit difficult. But I shall press them under here. And again, hold them a little bit with my fingers first so I can get the iron up here and get this pressed. And then after I have it pressed, it'll be an easy job to sew. It's the pressing that's the challenge because it pops right back out again. So it possibly will have to have a couple of pins on also as I'm doing the stitching. Well, here's the idea. This is very, very stubborn fabric that I have here. Uh, I'll do the other side the same way. And the way this is so stubborn, and it really isn't doing a whole lot on the iron, I think maybe I'll just leave this and go ahead and sew it without doing any pressing because it isn't, uh, it isn't conforming to my wishes too well there. So I'll just uh, turn this over as I go along and do the stitching and see what happens. 
what I actually needed was a little more steam in that iron and I wasn't getting enough to do the job. Okay, I'll push this under and just do a little stitching as I go along or do a little adjusting as I go along. And of course you would use uh, the same color thread instead of a contrast as I'm using here. So that would give a little different look. But anyway, this is the idea. And after you have this side done all the way down, then you do the other side the same way. I'll just cut over to the other side and do that. Now, not only did she have this to worry about at the seams, but also, what are you going to do about the hem? Well, she did her hem in the same way. She simply folded it up about uh, 5 eighths hem, a little bit more than that originally because she had to fold the raw edge under. But you get the idea of how the whole thing operates. So, stitch straighter than I did, but this is sort of how it's going to look when it's finished. Uh, you're going to also have to worry about the uh, sleeves. What do you do around those set-in sleeves? Because you can't, on a curve, press back these seams. Well, I noticed that what she has around the arm's eye here is simply a different piece of fabric. So there's another piece of fabric that has been sewn in the seam. And this is how that was done. It's a matter of getting a piece of fabric that's, oh, about an inch and a half wide. And I already pressed under one side of this, and I'm going to put it uh, right with another piece of denim here, and I'm going to stitch these two pieces to this denim. This time, I'm putting right sides together because it's going to work better uh, with the right sides together. Since I've put it at the wrong end, I'll just go ahead and stitch over on this side with the fabric under the arm of the machine. Since I have such a small piece, it really won't matter here but I'll stitch approximately a 5 8 inch seam. Do I have it together? Not quite. There it is. Okay, and then after this is stitched and pressed open, you can see that this fabric is coming out from between the seams, and then you'd put this one down. You can see that this would be easier, probably, if you had this piece of fabric as a, a bias cut instead of a straight cut because you are going to have to go around a curve, and that's always easier on the bias. In fact, it's impossible on the straight in most cases. So here's the idea. It would be necessary, of course, to gauge your uh, seams more carefully so that they would all turn out the very same size, and I have my little sleeve trim uh, larger than the seams. But you get the idea. So something you might want to try. I tried that then on my fabric, on my tulip fabric, to see what it looked like, and I decided that is not a good idea. I have both sides here, the flip side and the other side, and the reason it's not a good idea is that it just needlessly breaks up this big, big design in this fabric. So what I decided, everything that you sew is a learning experience. It teaches you a lot, and what I decided on this is no. If it's a big uh, pattern with a lot of uh, colors in it, a lot of design in it, then it's probably not a good idea to break it up all this much. It doesn't do anything for it. It doesn't enhance the fabric. It doesn't add to it, so don't bother with it. Let's see some other fabrics, though, that it would work on. Here's one that's very uh, interesting. This one is a twill weave. Here you can see the twill on this side. And then after it was woven like this, on the other side, it has been printed right on top of that twill in this paisley design, and it makes something very interesting. The fact that it's only two colors and the fact that it's a smaller design said to me, this might work out well. So this one I tried, and it does indeed work out in a very nice way. Here it is on both sides. So whichever side you decide you want on the outside, it would work out quite nicely. Uh, with this, you would have to make some bias also if you had to go around some curved seams. So the little bias tape makers work very well for this. This one would be the smaller one because it's a narrower piece. And with this, it curves so easily. If this doesn't curve as much as you want it to when you're sewing it or when you try to put it down on the fabric and sew it, take it over to the ironing board and curve it, pre-curve it with the ironing board before you put it down on the fabric and stitch around in a circle. This fabric is so soft, you can see how it just moves at my slightest whim. Therefore, with this fabric, I wouldn't necessarily even need to press it on the ironing board. I can quite easily 
curve it around and make a, a seam of this sort if I want to. Using a wider bias tape measure, I also wanted to see what would happen if I would bind the edges. And to bind the edges of this, now I do it more carefully. This wasn't wonderful, but you realize it can only be wonderful if you're really concentrating on it very hard and leaning over it. Uh, here's another one. This one was made with that wider bias tape maker, the same thing, but just a wider size so that it's a double fold bias tape by the time you have this done. And after you have this pressed, uh, when you first put it through the little bias tape maker, it presses like this so that the two sides are folded over. But then you fold it over yourself once more and don't have it quite the same size, upper and lower. Have the upper just a little bit shorter so that as you sew it over the edge, it'll catch the back side as well so that you won't have any problems with it. We'll insert this fabric between the two layers of the bias. And when we do this stitching, you can just do straight stitching there, which would be fine. But also, if your thread harmonizes, there's no reason why you can't do a little zigzag on it, because if you use a zigzag, it's going to be sure to catch the under layer as well as the upper layer, and it would be easier for you to do it that way. So I have pushed the little button that makes this zigzag, and uh, let's see what it looks like. Again, a contrasting thread so that you can see what it looks like but you understand it would be done in the same color, more than likely, when you would actually do it at home. And whether you do it this wide or whether you push it a little bit narrower, depends on what your preference is, might depend also on the width or the thickness of that fabric, because thicker fabrics would have to be a little bit wider. Thinner fabrics could be a little bit uh, narrower. But anyway, a very interesting technique, and it does work so beautifully on a two-color print of this sort, a two-faced fabric like this. Now, two-faced fabrics could be that because they are printed uh, in this manner. It could be because they are different textures. So let's see what happens with a different texture. Here, for instance, is a pink leather look. It is not actually leather, but it's a leather look on this. And the flip side of this looks like suede. So it would be a good place to use a combination of these two fabrics maybe in the same way as the denim suit, maybe just using one part uh, of the leather, one part of the suede. For instance, how about the whole jacket out of leather except the lapels or the yoke or something out of the suede side. So I might put those two together this way and see what I can do. It makes a garment a little bit more interesting if you can combine textures this way using the flip side and see what you come up with. A fabric that you're probably familiar with and have used many times and used it just one way. I noticed a really pretty blouse in a magazine the other day, and this was out of crepe back satin or satin back crepe, depending on which side you're looking at and therefore which side you feel is the right side. Here's the crepe side. Here's the satin side. Can you see the difference? I'm not sure how the light's hitting them. But to use these in combination can make something very rich, very nice. This was an extremely expensive blouse that I saw. And what it had was some pleats on the crepe side going down the front of the blouse. So I'll just stitch a couple of pleats. I've already pre-pressed some creases in here so that it will pleat. I'll just press a couple of them. I think I'll make them about how wide? About, oh, five-eighths. Seems like a good distance to make them. Whoops, I'm still on zigzag. Let's get it back on straight stitch and see how much better that does. Zigzag won't quite do the job if you're making pleats that you want to then press out flat. So I do like to experiment like this on any fabric before I actually make the garment. For that reason, I don't like to get right down to the last little bit, whatever the pattern calls for. I like to get some extra, not much maybe, but a little extra. A quarter yard isn't going to make or break you, I wouldn't think. And a quarter yard may be just what you need to experiment and get all your answers before you actually start working with that fabric so that you won't have anything dreadful happen and won't have any disappointments. If you have some little half-made garment back in the closet that you haven't finished because you didn't like the way it was turning out, then uh, this says that next time better experiment a little bit to make sure of what you're doing, to make sure of what you have before you actually start in in the garment. So that extra little yardage would do the job. 
Well, after I do about two or three pleats like this, and after I would press those over, I would then maybe do something else around the uh, facing of it, that something else, in this case, do I have the iron too hot? Possibly. We shall see. I'm just going to smooth these sideways so that they flatten out with pleats because I had a bigger spacing between the pleats than the pleat itself. You can see the stitching here, which is fine. It, there's nothing wrong with it. But if I didn't want to see that stitching, what I would have to have is larger pleats than the space between them. And in that way, you wouldn't see any stitching anywhere. They would all overlap each other a little bit. So think about that also when you're planning pleats and decide whether you want your stitching to so show or not. Then if we would, across the end of this, stitch something from the other side, from the satin side, such as pleats down the front of the blouse and then the facing that goes around the neck, have that the satin side. And that's the way I saw it in a magazine, and it was really pretty. So it's something you might want to try and see how it works out for you. Everything that you do, you want a very special look with. Don't make it the way necessarily the pattern maker intended you to. Add your own special thing since you are the designer. Uh, make it look like a designer has done it instead of ordinary run-of-the-mill type thing. So mixing textures, the smooth and the rough side or whatever it is, mixing textures is something that works quite well. Another fabric that I bought a small sample of, and I wished later I had bought a bigger sample of because I realized I would have a, a whole lot more to experiment with had I just bought a little more of this. Well, what that fabric is, is a double-faced fabric. You saw this on Series 2, perhaps, as I was doing some inseam buttonholes. Here's an inseam buttonhole that I did. And what I was doing this for was picture this down the front of a jacket. If the jacket would be this red, and I would just have a band then, sort of a Chanel-looking jacket with that band down the front, and put the inseam buttonhole between the band and the jacket. That's the idea of this, and it could be quite effective, but not the way I've done it here. What's wrong with this is that it just breaks up the pattern, and it shouldn't really. So you'd really have to plan this carefully, and you'd really have to buy some extra fabric here. How much extra fabric depends on the uh, repeat of that design. Buy at least one repeat if you're going to do this. So, for instance, if this one repeated every, oh, 18 inches, you'd buy an extra half yard to make sure that you could match things well. The jacket I'm wearing has a much larger repeat than that. I think it's more than a yard. It's really quite a large repeat. Because of that, uh, I would have to buy considerably more in order to get everything to work out just right. Well, with this one, let me show you what I mean, that it could be more effective if you would uh, get everything matched. Here, for instance, is, well, first of all, this, this uh, fabric is so interesting because it's a double cloth. It has been woven with five layers, well, maybe not, maybe four layers of yarn. Uh, but notice how if I can get into one of these patterns, I can't. Uh, here's maybe a bigger space that I can open up. But what's so interesting about this is this flower opens up, and you can see two distinct layers of fabric here with another little set of yarns in between to pad them out. So this flower is blue on this side, but then it reverses to red on the other side. The very same design on both sides, it simply reverses. Anytime you find something of this sort, it's probably an expensive fabric. But even though it is expensive, if you're going to use it, buy enough to do it effectively or don't buy it at all. So here's what would have been more effective if I had done it on this little front band. If I have found a place where the flower would reverse, this would make it more effective. Uh, so this might be one interesting possibility. If I had a larger piece of fabric here, I could show you a still more interesting possibility I realized after it was too late and I uh, no longer had access to that store to go back and get some more. But what would have made it even more interesting is if it would be sort of shadow and light. If I could, instead of having these a mirror image of each other, had broken it right here and put the red as I could have, I, I think, if I had a bigger piece of fabric, I could have moved that same red flower here so that it would be facing all the same direction. It would be all one flower, but half of it blue and half of it red. So you really have to study these things very intently and look at all the possibilities and look at those possibilities in the fabric shop 
plan to spend some time there and play with it like this to see, oh yes, look what would happen if I would move this or that. Uh, so do things of this sort. Here's another little flower, completely different, but one's a mirror image of the other. So it can be quite effective. This also I might do as a yoke or as a collar or a contrast that way, or maybe different sleeves. Uh, be careful about breaking it all up. It can look just sort of hokey, but also it can be very dramatic and very effective if you do it properly, if you really think it through before you buy it and do purchase the right amount then. Some other fabrics that mix well and aren't even supposed to, aren't even intended to perhaps. I bought these in two different cities actually. Miles apart, there were two different manufacturers. They had nothing to do with each other. But what was interesting about these two fabrics that would make a nice reverse, a nice combination, is the fact that they have the very same colors in them. And so you can combine fabrics very well as long as they have the same colors. They look then like they belong together, like a designer had combined these. Uh, what I found interesting is that this almost looked like it was an abstraction, just a uh, sort of a hazy, watercolory uh, version of the one that was down here on the bottom. So that's another interesting possibility if you want to have a flip side. Now I keep showing you this fabric over here through series one and two, and here it is again on series three, my favorite fabric that's here, and this one that I just love, this metallic, I still haven't made up my mind what I'm going to make. Don't do anything hastily and be sorry for it, but this one has a great flip side. The flip side is possibly, well, depending on your likes, who's to say which is the right side? They are both just terrific. So I still haven't decided what I'm going to do with that. One of these days, you'll see me wearing it. It will crop up, all ready to wear. Some other things that kind of have a flip side, down here, already made up, are some clothing. This one has a flip side. It's a reversible vest, and it was done by fabricating this, by sewing together the two pieces of fabric, uh, quilting them. There's some quilt batting in the center. The same is true of this jacket. These edges are just bound on both of them so that they're quite easy to simulate. You can do this quite well. This could be a reversible also, as long as you didn't sew in shoulder pads, because what has been done here is uh, the, the seams around the arm's eye has been bound. So that would also be an interesting way of handling it. Here are some vests, and some of these fabrics that you buy are purchased this way. This one was purchased. It's a quilted fabric, and it has two sides, so you use it as you like. This one had a great deal of quilting done inside, some very interesting uh, quilting of various sorts using solid and uh, plain fabrics. So this is another interesting combination that you want to do. Uh, another uh, way to do this possibly is make something completely reversible by using two layers of fabric, but not quilting them in any way. This skirt was uh, reversible, and one side was completely sewn. The other side was a separate skirt. Then they're just stitched together around the outside. These are, I had all kinds of friends who, when they heard I was going to do this, said, oh, here, I have this garment or that garment to show you. This raincoat is the same thing, borrowed from a friend. But it's two separate raincoats, and then they are just joined uh, all around the outside so that they can become one garment. Well, you can see there are a lot of possibilities, but in the final analysis, I decided I'm not going to flip this fabric that I'm wearing. I am instead just going to use it as one fabric. But there was still a huge challenge. Notice, for instance, that if I button this jacket, it's the same flower that goes over the edge here. Notice that it's the same flower that goes from the jacket, from the bodice, over into the sleeve. Uh, the same way on the other side, there's the same flower going into the sleeve. It's nice to have a slash pocket that you can just put your hand in, and the vent there, this extra welt, rather, that's on the pocket, fades away because it's a complete match. This is a little difficult, but that's part of the fun of sewing. I love those difficult things. I love those challenges, and that's what makes it such fun. It takes it away from the humdrum and really makes you think your way through. I have told you in two other series, and I'm telling you again, sewing is for people who do a great deal of thinking because you must do this. Uh, something else I thought about is, why not combine some seams? Because I had so much matching to do. How about combining those seams so there are no side seams in it? And that way, uh, there's a little bit less to combine. Uh, maybe I was a little bit lucky in that, but maybe also I just worked with it enough that it did work out just right. 
So a lot of things that you need to think about on any of these unusual fabrics. And uh, don't ignore them just because they look like, oh boy, that's going to be a hard job. Get them anyway because you need the exercise maybe. Your brain needs a little bit of, of that uh, stretching so that you can get those to work out just right. Notice also that if you look at this carefully, not only does it have those flowers, it actually has those flowers in stripes. And those stripes must go straight across this. Everything must match perfectly or don't even get it, don't sew it, don't wear it. The tapestry of this jacket was more than reversible, as I've been telling you. I noticed immediately because of these horizontal stripes, it would have to be matched. Also, those flowers would have to be matched at the front, the bodice, the sleeve, all those places that I've pointed out. And of course, that welt pocket, which matches so perfectly, it can hardly be seen. All these things don't just happen serendipitously. It takes a lot of thought. So join me next time and I'll show you how to think through all this type thing and match perfectly.